Field Church, and Peter takes us into the home right off the bat. Is the meter picking up my voice, Charlie? Okay, good. All right. Ephesians chapter 6. Follow along as I read the first four verses of this text. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. And you, fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. May God bless the reading of His Word, His instruction given to us. Let's pray. Blessed Father, thank you that the Apostle Paul left this instruction to the church at Ephesus, and as this letter was read, it was no doubt recognized as important, began to be copied and distributed to other churches in the ancient world. They read it this and then it's been copied down through the ages and come to the printing press and some translated it into languages, continues that process even today and we have in our hands the Word of God is translated into the English language. I'm so grateful for that. Bless our understanding and consideration of your Word especially in these days when the family is under assault by every institution that we know. There's a concerted effort to destroy the family, to destroy the church, and to destroy society in general. It's satanic, we know that, for reasons Unknown to us, our Father, you have given Satan permission to unleash himself in all of his insidious ways upon society. We know he's the prince of the power of the air. He's under restraint. We see Job was not attacked by Satan until you gave him permission. We know that there's a spiritual warfare ongoing, and we'll study that when we come later in this text to the spiritual warfare passage. We, we are in days, our Father, of warfare. It's not physical, but it is spiritual in nature. Give us strength, fortify us for the battle that we'll face individually and corporately as believers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Childbearing is a difficult task. Marriage is difficult in and of itself. And child rearing is difficult from the standpoint that God has delivered you, he delivered into your hands and into your care, pagans. They're not believers. They're sinners. They're under the sentence of death, just as you are, tragically. And unfortunately, abortion has taken the lives of over 60 million in our nation. They have died needlessly. It's a matter of convenience to the altar of Molech, to the altar of Baal. It is the sacrament of the leftists in our society, the progressives. A sacrament of offering up babies. It can't be justified. 
And that's one contributing factor to the reason our nation is under judgment. It is doing everything within its power to undermine and destroy the family, to destroy the home. Last week we looked at wives and husbands, their responsibilities. Wives are to submit, husbands are to love, and this is the expression of verse 21, submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. Now the commandments given here in chapter 6, verse 1, given to children, I would assume they have reached a level of understanding at this point for this commandment to make any sense to them. Because a newborn, a toddler, uh, this commandment would make no sense. They've reached, reached a point or a level in their understanding that they know what it means to obey, what it means to disobey authority. And in this context, the authority is parental authority. Children. So if you are at a point, you know, junior age, adolescent age, this commandment is for you. You know what it means to obey when you are given a direct command. You're to respond to it in obedience. You may not understand it. Just understand this, that your parents have been around a lot longer than you. It's a command, unless it's a violation of some biblical principle, it's a command which you're obligated to obey. You're to step up to the plate and do what they ask you to do. It may be open to discussion for some reasoning, but you are to obey it. You are to obey it. You have an obligation to obey your parents. Turn with me to a passage found in the book of Micah. That's in the Old Testament. The book of Micah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Obadiah, Micah. Describing the zeitgeist of his day, he says, For son dishonors father, daughter rises against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own household. It is a day of spiritual confusion, a day of chaos. It anticipates a time when there would be disloyalty. As a matter of fact, the New, New Testament is clear on one of the, uh, the features of this day in which we live. Disobedient to parents, all rights to Timothy. Provisions are made in the law, Deuteronomy 21, if a man has a stubborn and rebellious son who will not obey the voice of his father or mother, who, when having chastened him, will not eat them, then his father and mother shall take hold of him and bring him out to the elders of the city, to the gate of the city, and they shall say to the elders of his city, this son of ours is stubborn. 
and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He's a glutton and a drunkard. Then all the men of the city shall stone him to death with stones. So shall you put away the evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear in fear. Obviously, he's talking about a reprobate who will not respond to instruction at all. This responsibility given to us in this text of Scripture is responsibility to obey your parents, young people. It's, it's, it's a mandate. Children have a calling in life. And that is to follow. Now, obviously Paul is writing to believers and he's writing to children who ostensibly are in a Christian home. You better think, I, I hate to use the term, but it was an expression growing up, thank your lucky stars. I don't believe in luck, first of all. But you better thank God that you have been placed in a Christian home. Especially in the nation in which we live at this time. You have been fortunate to be placed there. Trust your parents. Obey them. specific command here, and that is to obey your parents, those in authority over you. Turn, turn with me back to Proverbs chapter 1 where we were reading earlier. We didn't read further in that text of scripture in chapter 1, but it is instructive. Very instructive. Verse 8, Solomon is writing to his son, or it's believed, well, if it is, he's re, uh, writing to Rehoboam, one of his children, who would be his successor, my son, or he's, re, he's writing to the next generation, for which the son is represented. My son, hear the instruction of your father. And do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. My son, if sinners enticed you, do not consent, for if they say, Come with us, let us lie in wait to shed blood. Let us swallow them up alive, like Sheol, that would be the grave, and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all kinds of precious possessions. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Solomon's instruction to his son is, is cast, they'll say, cast in your lot. But he says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. You need to be very instructive about to your children about who they associate with in life. And you need to cut friends out of their life as long as you have control over them. You need to cut them out of their lives. Because they can have a deleterious, a detrimental uh, effect upon them. And so this whole section of chapter 1 through 9 deals with instruction that is given from Solomon to the next generation to his children and it would do you well to read that and apply its wisdom but the, the, the book of, of Proverbs is written to make people wise it is to take the instruction of Torah which is knowledge and apply it to the daily events of life. The parent has a responsibility to instill obedience in the child. As I said before, that child being entrusted into your arms early on in life will not 
obey you automatically. They have to be instructed in the area of obedience. And then when they reach that later age, teenage, even 9, 10, 11, then they'll understand what obedience is. And they'll understand, hopefully, what the consequences are of their actions. Otherwise, you will chasten them. You chasten them to bring them into, into compliance. This is very instructive. They will not obey you naturally. And you're not to reason with them. If they're going for a hot stove or a hot implement, they'll scar their hands. You'll do everything in your power. You'll shout, shout to your uh, lungs give out to have them avoid danger. But life is dangerous. And you need to prepare them to obey your implicit commands. Those who serve in the military understand what that is. Now, military has changed, but there was a time in the military that when someone in authority over you gave a command, it was expected that you obey. Obey your parents in the Lord. That couches the instruction given here with the idea that it is in conjunction with a Christian influence, a godly home, a, 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 a home under the sovereignty of the Lord himself. Moses writes in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verse 15, He who strikes his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. He who curses his father or mother shall surely be put to death. Obviously, this is an extreme. What the point is, is that the child is to show respect. Respect. Jesus dealt with that in his day, with his generation. They challenged him on breaking the tradition, their tradition. And then he responds to them in, in Matthew 15, 3. Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your traditions. For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and mother, and he who curses father and mother, let him be put to death. But you say, whoever says to his father or mother, whatever profit you have gained from me is a gift of God then he need not honor his father or mother. Thus you have made the commandment of God no effect of your tradition. In other words, later in life, the children are older, out on their own, but the parents are in, in desperate need of finances. And so they come to their children and say, Son, can you help us? Now we're in desperate need. And so the son says, Well, I'd love to. But I've dedicated this money to the Lord. It's core debt. It's a dedicated gift. And thereby, because they dedicated it to the temple or to some uh, spiritual or religious activity, thereby they've elevated that money supposedly, but in the process they've violated the command to honor their father and mother. One thing I hear from Dennis Prager, who's a Jewish man who was instructed in Torah, he was instructed in Yeshiva. So, and he always puts this caveat in. He says, There were things about my parents I didn't like, but I did understand one thing that I honor my parents. And he said, I call them at least once a week in honor and respect for them, up and even until their death. He honored his parents in respect for this. I appreciate my children by and large. I got a note from my daughter, Lisa. This came out of the 
blue. But she, she said she appreciated her upbringing in her home and she appreciated my life and the instructions and so forth that I had given her throughout life and then guide her to this day. And that's one of those occasions where your children rise up and call you blessed and you appreciate it very much. I, I believe my children respect us. We're in the midst of a painting project at our home and our daughter has made several trips down to help us out of respect and honor for me because I'm getting old. Mm -hmm. Older. But they, they show respect for us and honor us. I hope you carry that through life. If you love and appreciate your parents, even though you may have been brought up in a, in a, in a difficult environment, no, not every home out there is is a Christian home or a special home, but if God has saved you in some way, show honor and respect to your parents. And he gives an explanation. He says, this is right. In other words, it's the right thing to do. Do you remember First Lady Laura Bush she recalled one overnight visit from her husband in the home of his parents, the former president, Mrs. Bush. He woke up at 6 a.m. as usual and went downstairs to get a cup of coffee, Mrs. Bush says. And he sat down on the sofa with his parents and put his feet up. And all of a sudden, Barbara Bush yelled, put your feet down. George's dad replied, for goodness sake, Barbara, he's president of the United States. <laughs> and Barbara said, I don't care. I don't want his feet on my table. And the pre president, mind you, promptly did as he was told. For as Mrs. Bush observes, quote, even presidents have to listen to their mother. Listen to them. Obey them. It's right. It's the right thing to do. It places it in the context of a Christian worldview. Unless there's some violation of God's specific revealed word or there is danger in what they're saying, you have a responsibility. Now, I know the structure in our society today militates against that in many respects because the state believes they own your children. You're just custodians, caretakers. That's the way the state looks at it. And so they can come in and intervene in your family and take your children away seemingly for trivial causes. Now, I understand child abuse if, if your children are being beaten physically, tortured mentally, put in cages as some parents do with their, their children and want to be bothered with them. I tell you, you, you see extremes in, in the world around us. But in a Christian context and with a Christian worldview, there is no reason why you should not obey your parents. You are not just their custodians. You are the ones who brought them into this world and you will be responsible for their care. And you, young people, will be responsible and give an account someday for your respect and honor of your parents. This command goes on and is amplified and supported and buttressed by the command, honor your father and mother. So it brings in both, and I understand that there are many today who have single mothers, single fathers, who have the care of children because of divorce 
and, and because of the sinfulness of society that happens, I understand that. But in a Christian home, this is a nuclear family. Husband and wife and children. The mandate still applies. Honor your father and your mother. Notice he puts, puts this little caveat with it. He says, this is the first command with a promise. In other words, the other commands that are outlined in the moral law in the Ten Commandments don't have any promises associated or put with them. This one is. I used to put a display here of the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you remember that, but since we don't have the organ, it, it makes it difficult. And it's, it's, it's believed to have been formed in two tablets, and it was. The first tablet of the law dealt with man's relationship with God. The second tablet of the law dealt with man's relationship with man. And in the second tablet of the law on the top of the list is honor thy father and thy mother. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, I debate that a little bit. I'm not going to be sticklish about it. It's a moot point and can be discussed, but I believe that that command falls in to the first tablet of the law. I can't be definitive about that. And the reason I believe that is because your honor of your parents, according to the text we read in Matthew chapter 15, where they were violating the command of God by committing gifts to religious causes and thereby binding the gift and thereby bypassing the law to honor father and mother. To honor your father and mother is to honor God. They thought they were honoring God by tying up their resources in some religious commitment. They didn't even have to give. The money didn't actually have to be appropriated to that cause. All they had to do is say, well, that's what we're going to do with it. We'll bind it. We'll consider it corporate. And thereby, it relieves them of their responsibility to the parents. And to dishonor your parents is to dishonor God. And you'll give an account for it. He gives a twofold promise here that it might be well with you. That it might be well with you. And that you will be on the earth a long time. Now that doesn't necessarily work out in every instance, but the promise that God gives his people that is that if you honor your father and mother, and thereby honor me. I will give you a long life on this planet, and things will generally go well with you. Everybody faces difficulties. I always, I tried to honor my parents after becoming a believer. It wasn't always easy being a distance away, but my, my parents were good. I, didn't, I wasn't raised in the, the best of Christian homes. It's better than most out there. They cared for my salvation. They cared for my soul. They took me and instructed me religiously, took me to services when I didn't want to go. 
because they were concerned about my spiritual wealth. I am concerned about my children's spiritual welfare. I believe they all know the Lord. They haven't always made wise decisions in life. So I haven't always made wise decisions in life. But I am confident, at least at this point, that if they die, they are going to heaven. And I'm confident of their respect to me. It flows out of the respect for God by which they have been trained. I see the clock is my enemy this morning. We do have the Lord's Supper, but let me just use an illustration here, and I think I'll wait until next week to deal with the role of, of uh, a father in training his child, training his children, because it's so important in this day and age. John Maxwell, in an article entitled, What Children Owe Their Parents, and then in parentheses he has, and themselves, this is the title of the parent that he, of his article, his message actually. It says, three of my best friends have died in the past two months. Two of them, 24 hours apart. And all three of them were younger than I am, being 70 now. I don't know where to place that chronologically. But suffice to the illustration, he goes on. When I was a teenager and later a young man, I could not understand my father's sadness as he said, all I do nowadays is attend funerals. His friends were dying all around him. Now it's happening to me. When my grandparents died, my mother said that they, my parents, were now the next row of trees to be chopped. Now I'm here. And that's the case with me. I have friends I see on Facebook from high school days. One of the, the, the ladies that, that I graduated with in 1964. She just died recently, pancreatic cancer. I had not seen her post on Facebook for some time. I don't know what happened. And then after she died, her husband took her Facebook page and posted on there that she passed away. Passed away. So I'm there. What surprises me is that so many older people seem oblivious to the fact that they do not have long to live anymore. If you seem to seek the God Almighty that they will soon face. I've been giving thought to that myself. Some people say, well, I'll just wait. I'll get serious about serving the Lord or I'll get serious about following Him later. I'm not ready now. I'm thankful God saved me when He did. I was 20 years old, 1967. And I followed Him, tried to use the skills that He's given me, the training that He's given me in His service, but I followed Him for these past 50 plus years. Why would God reach down? Now, I understand people are saved later in life, and I rejoice in that. But why, as a rule, or a general principle, would God reach down and save one, someone and touch their lives on their deathbed, like the thief on the cross? That's commonly the illustration that is used. Oh, the thief on the cross. Yeah, and we, we all rejoice in that. But how much time left did he have to serve God? He went straight to heaven. God reaches down and saves and touch people most of the time, by and large, in their years of vigor, so that they have time to devote to Him. That's why Solomon says, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. The, day, the days of declining health. 
the days when you're bedfast and can't move. The time to use your energies is now, as a young person, if you know him, in the service of the Lord. He continues, he says, and they continue bickering about irrelevant things and continue to manipulate and anger their children and other people with serious selfishness. One time I was asked to go and speak in an old age home. I got angry when I heard that many of the old people were severely neglected by their children and were very lonely and in lack of needed things. They were rarely visited by their children. I wanted to speak out against those children, but the minister of the congregation, who was a wise man, stopped me in order to give me a proper perspective. He said, I should first look at the scriptural principle at play here. The principle is, Galatians 6, 7, God is not mine. What you sow, you shall reap. Many of those old people were reaping the fruits of their neglected, their neglect and abuse of their own children. Just thinking, he said, just thinking. Let me assure you, parents, if you raise your children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, and they come to faith in Christ, they will honor, they will obey. You're responsible for the direction, the trajectory of their lives on a certain level. You can't save them, but you can bring them to the dinner plate, the dinner table, and set the food before them. They'll not get saved in a vacuum. They will need to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have trusted the Lord Jesus, the greatest delight of a parent's heart is to see their children come to know the Lord. I have made a profession at nine years old. I shared with you that before. I was baptized at 13. I didn't know the Lord. I had made a profession. I had gone through the motions. I prayed some type of prayer, but I was lost. And where it really wasn't until I was 20 years old that my dad was attending church with me. I came out after this service and we drove home together. And he said, what you do? Go we'll forward to join the church. I said, no, Dad. I want to be saved. And I was instructed. I understood. I was lost. I, was, I understood. But a lot of times, we as parents presume our children are believers. And they're not. Pray for their salvation. And children, you need to take to heart. I mean this. Take to heart the instruction of the Lord that your parents give you from the Word of God. And if they tell you to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, as they are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, take that as serious truth. So as we close and transition into the Lord's table, the challenges of parenthood are enormous. But it is your responsibility, children, to respond to your parents that it might go well with you. And it is your responsibility, parents, and we'll see that more next week, to civilize and discipline your children. God help us in these days. Let's close in prayer. Father, I thank you this morning from the depths of my being for reaching down and touching my life and saving me delivering me from sin's penalty and 
removed, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And not only re removing the penalty, but now through the indwelling spirit and through the word of God delivering me from the power of sin. Let not sin have dominion over you, Paul writes, that ye should obey it in its lust. We have a new ruler, a new dominion in which we function. That is the dominion of grace under the Lord Jesus. O oh God, save our children. I remember an evangelist saying once, that's the only treasure that we can take out of this life into the next, is to take our children. And indeed, they are a treasure entrusted to us. Save them, O oh our God, by thy grace. Save them by thy grace our example of godliness, living the gospel out before them. Humble them. Humble them under the mighty hand of God. And may they seek to devote their lives in full service to the Lord, whether it be a parent, as a parent, or on their job, or wherever it is, to devote their lives to following Christ, especially in these days when there are so many allurements. In Jesus' name I ask you, man.